In the last round game from Norway Chess between Hikaru Nakamura and Fab Fabiano Caruana, we saw this very direct opening variation, knight g5, an opening which goes back hundreds of years. And that immediately puts in mind another game uh, from this opening from Bobby Fischer's 60 memorable games. Hopefully you can see that clearly. Yeah, there we go. It's a book I've had in my bookshelf since, I don't know, it's probably 11 or 12 years old. One of the first chess books I ever got. And there's a game in there that Fischer played against Arthur Bisgaier. Played in 963. Fischer was around about 20 years old. Bisgaier, Grandmaster, uh, an absolute stalwart of American chess. Uh, I, I always picture him as kind of an old man, but he actually, when this was played, he was in his early 30s. And yeah, a very fine player in his own right. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at this game and compare Fisher's play and his analysis in, in the book, um, checking it with a computer. Now, I'm not doing this in some kind of nerdy way to sort of point the finger and say, oh, you could have done better. Um, I just think it's very interesting to see Fisher's style and how it stands up to you know, absolutely objective computer analysis as well. So here we go. Knight g5. Incidentally, this is an opening that I'm going to be covering in my opening survey for um, $25 patrons. Um, so do check that out if you're interested. So here we go. Knight d5, uh, excuse me, d5. There's an alternative there, which is bishop c5, which is pretty crazy. Probably not very good, but very interesting. But d5 is the standard move. And then knight a5 is the main line. Check. c6, exchange of pawns. And if you remember, Nakamura played bishop d3 here. But Fischer went with bishop e2. And here is quite an extraordinary moment, actually, because after h6, the accepted move for, well, many years was knight f3, which leads to this position. And I think that the theoretical assessment here is that basically black has good compensation because this knight gets in the way of white's pieces and white, black can develop very easily. But Fischer played knight h3, which was an old move played by Steinitz, among others, um, you know, way back. And Fischer writes, To my knowledge, this is the first time that this had been employed in Grandmaster Chess for over 70 years. And it does look like a very strange move. Um, interestingly, if you look at databases, knight h3 actually scores better than knight f3 and has been played by mavericks such as Aronian, Rapport, Jabava, Ivanchuk for example. Okay, so bishop c5 played by Bizkaia. And Fisher castles here. Well as he notes himself, d3 is actually more flexible. And, well, he actually played this a couple of rounds um, after this game in the same tournament. And it's just interesting to look at this. So this wasn't the Bizguy game. This is against Radojic. And black took. By the way, if black doesn't take here, then it could be that white will simply play king h1 and drop the knight back to g1, and then it bounces out again and there are no difficulties. So black takes, I mean, it looks inviting to damage white's pawns. But watch what happens. Fisher played like this. And actually, positionally, white is doing very well here. If you think back to, for example, Fisher against Anderson, that incredible reversed hedgehog position where Fisher played king h1 and rook g1 and g4, and it was all about conquering that e4 square, you can see the pawn covers f5. So that knight has a beautiful square on e4 
positionally, white is doing extremely well here. Compare that knight to when it gets to e4 with that wayward beast on a5. So here, castles instead, So, but d3 more flexible, more accurate. It's interesting, Fischer spends a lot of time giving analysis, for example, of very old moves like g5. Um, he was obviously very well versed in these old games, but Bisgaya plays castles, and that, that's far more sensible. d3, and, well, for example, Fischer cites a game between Steinitz and Chigorin from Havana 1892 that, that went knight d5 here. Interestingly, Stockfish 15 thinks Black's best move is knight b7. And I find that very interesting because this knight on a5 is very poorly placed. And instead of going for some quick attack on the king side, Stockfish is more concerned about just bringing this piece into the game. You know, every piece counts. You know, no child gets left behind. Anyway, this guy exchanged on h3, which certainly isn't bad. Queen d7. In this case, bishop g4 would be met by an exchange and then f5. And in that case, well, look at white's pieces on the queen side. They're still on their starting blocks and black has a big attack on the king. And Fischer said, didn't like the king going to g2, that's not where the king belongs. And yes, it doesn't take too long for that knight to hit h4, and that's really dangerous. But he said, he said, I wanted my light squared bishop on g2, and he played bishop f3. So returning the extra pawn, queen takes h3. And here Fischer said, he didn't like bishop g2 because of queen h4, and he analysed complicated variation with queen e1. But Stockfish likes queen f3, and to my eyes that looks very logical, basically to shut out black's queen. And then you play with the bishops, and the fact that this knight is offside as well. And, for example, after e4, well, you can exchange queens here. And white has to be a bit better with those bishops. But knight e2 from Fischer. And rook d8. Now bishop g2. And queen f5 was played. Um, the machine prefers queen e6. And I think the reason might be that once the knight gets to d5, then it's possible some time to advance the f-pawn. Not always a good move, as uh, Fabiano can tell you. But anyway, queen f5, I and mean, black is still very active here. And it's just a very unclear position. And here again, Fischer play goes for queen e1. This is the move he obviously has on his mind the whole time. Um, but queen f3 feels, to my eyes, like a very natural move. The computer quite likes it. The computer actually, most of all, it likes rook b1. Um, but queen f3 also acceptable. Um, and it feels to me like white is a bit better here. So, well, listen, the computer thinks that white is slightly better here. But just in general, you know, with the two bishops and the king pretty well protected with the queen on this side of the board, I would certainly prefer to play white. Look at that knight. It's not good on a5. But Fischer goes for queen e1, which is much more complicated. You know, normally he likes clarity. So, you know, I find this move quite surprising. But as he said earlier on in his annotations, he said, I have faith in the two bishops. So rook e8 played. Not, not quite sure why knight b7 wasn't played, but anyway. Uh, rook e8, knight e4. Bishop b6, and Fischer exchanged off, and played king h1. So he puts the king in the corner, it's protected by that bishop on this diagonal, and he's looking to play f4. 
to bring this bishop into the game. And Fisher thought that g5 was a good move here. And this is very typical of him. He likes to really put a clamp on his opponent's position. So in playing g5, Fisher was worried that he wouldn't be able to get in f4. And he was concerned that this knight would be able to flip around to the king side. And that does look really menacing. But the machine actually thinks that white can generate enough play here with bishop b2 and if that knight spins over I mean this is this is very old school computer chess actually you know feels that uh, white can get away with this and this does look very impressive actually f4 exploiting all these pins Let's go back. So g5, not as good as as Fisher actually thought in his analysis. Bisguy played c5, so he wants to bring the knight back into play via c6, which certainly looks reasonable. Um, yeah, once again, Fisher, he goes for queen c3, but the machine wants queen e4 and queen f3 again to match black's queen. It's obviously very concerned about black's queen, a lot of these variations, and, and the position is about equal. But instead of queen e4, queen c3, played by Fisher, and to my eyes that looks really risky when the king is a little bit exposed, but he obviously has enormous faith in that bishop controlling all those light squares and covering the king. Knight c6. I mean, to my eyes, that looks really scary. f4. Blast the position open. Well, if Fisher doesn't do that, then the knight is coming into d4. And, yeah, hard to see where white's play is coming from. So f4. Knight d4. This looks so scary. And, in fact, uh, the machine thinks that um, black is certainly a bit better here. Queen c4, so he's lining up against f7. That's where he's looking for counterplay. Queen g6, c3. Fisher said, I have to expel that knight. Yeah, it looks good. This guy played what looks like a very natural move, knight f5. Knight c2 is a very computery move, and that is the best move, according to the machine. And here's why, if rook b1 takes and black can take on d3, that knight actually does a very good job of covering these squares. It'll find safety because it can always spin back to e3. It's still a very messy position. Or here, if f5, queen h5, watch out for this, rook b1, e4, and bishop c7. This looks very scary indeed. Um, let's go back. So c3, but knight f5 played. So it's a far more natural move. I mean, the knight covers here. It perhaps can bounce to h4. f takes e5. Rook takes and bishop f4. So finally, Fisher has managed to develop the queen's bishop on move 25 and he's managed to connect the rooks so he's got his bishops working that was basically he's been building up to this for the past 10 12 moves you know he's desperate to get developed and after rookie two this looks so scary that rook uh looking at the second rank threatening mate um, and Fisher played bishop e4. I mean, you need incredible nerves to play this with white. Here, Bisgaya blundered. He took on b2. As Fisher points out, rook e8 is the best move, and the machine agrees with him. Fisher thought here that white's best was to play bishop f3. Oh, incidentally, if rook g1, 
yeah, this turns out this is better for black. I mean, there's long, complicated variation, but basically uh, there is trouble here, basically. Um, Fisher thought that bishop f3 was best, pushing the rook away, and then rook e1. And his assessment was, with even chances due to the bishop pair, I think that's pretty optimistic. Um, at the moment, black is a pawn up. That rook is so scary on the second rank. Um, it is still very tricky. But the machine thinks that this position certainly gives black the better chances. Um, it's not easy to see how, how white is playing from that position at all. But instead of rook e8, Bizguy played rook takes b2. And now Fisher has a winning move. What is white's move? Okay, white to play. Your turn. Cheers. You have a think. I'll have a drink. Tea, naturally. White wins with bishop e5. And look at them cutting down here and the threat is bishop takes knight and there's not a lot that can be done about that. Reminds me a little bit of the first game of Fisher's match against Larson from Denver 1971. French winnower where those bishops of Fisher just controlled so many squares across the board and in fact covered the king as well. So bishop e5, rook e8 played... Rook takes f5, so white is a piece up, and now white is a rook up, and that was the end of that. If the queen moves away, then rook e8, and, well, black has to give up the queen, which isn't too promising. Well, honestly, I thought fascinating to see how Fisher played that, and... I think this opening just shows how diligent he was as a researcher. That he'd obviously been analysing knight h3. You know, he knew a lot of the theory. He'd obviously studied Steinitz's games. And to recognise that this somewhat discredited move was actually quite playable, um, I think is really remarkable and just shows Fisher's kind of strength of mind and confidence in his judgment. He was only 20 when this game was played. And I think that's really remarkable. And since then, as I said, many other players have played it. And yes, we can see his love for the two bishops, which maybe he pushed it a little bit too far, but he got away with it. He certainly got away with it. As I said, I'm going to be covering knight g5 in my Patreon opening survey. So if you're interested in that, then do check out the tiers. You have to get to the $25 tier before you can check out the uh, opening archives, but I would say it's well worth it. Anyway, thanks very much for watching.